would such a wretched thing. Maybe it wouldn't be. And I, I mean, you might say, well, that's a pretty casual answer. What, what do you say to people who have a parent who's dying of Alzheimer's disease, for example? It's like, well, they're going to get their act together and it's going to fix that? It's like, it'll make it a hell of a lot better than it would be otherwise, I can tell you that. And that's something. Because it's bad enough to have someone who's deadly ill in your family without having an incredible amount of unnecessary pathology gather around that and make some, make all sorts of errors before you manage that. But I've watched people long enough in my clinical practice to know that waiting for Godot is a very bad idea. And not growing up is a very bad idea. It's like implement the best plan you have at hand. And learn from it. And that works. And you get sharper at making your plans. And then the other thing that we do in the future of the program is we ask people, well, maybe you can't decide what your passion or your calling should be. That's a pretty global question. But you might ask yourself some questions like, well, is there something you can do to improve your intimate relationship? One thing, is there a way that you can improve your friendships? Is there something you can do at your job that would make it better than it is? now, even if it's something incremental. Could you do something more productive and meaningful with your time outside of work? Could you be slightly better at handling temptations that come to your little spiral upward? It does spiral upward. There's a statement in the New Testament, which actually happens to be a true statement, which is, to those who have everything, more will be given. And it's a, it's a reflection of an underlying phenomenon that looks like phenomenon that looks like a natural law, which means that as things start to accrue to you, the rate at which they will further accrue will increase. That's a natural law. It's called Price's Law sometimes, or, the, or, or, or Pareto, it's reflected in the Pareto distribution. So there's a chapter in, rule, in 12 Rules for Life called uh, Don't Compare Yourself. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. And it's an injunction for incremental improvement. If you don't know where to go in your life, well, think about where you are and see if today you can make where you are somewhat better on some dimension. So that when you go to bed at night, you're not as wretched as you were when you woke up in the morning. And so if you do that for two years, you know, one thing a day, just a small thing, something you could actually do that you would do, then your life will be way better. And at the end of that, you might have enough clarity of mind to start to understand where you could go if things worked out for you properly in the world. So, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> others to fix themselves if they refuse personal responsibility and or blame an ideologically rooted system for all their troubles. By example, that's the best way to do it. You know, you are not where you think you are. That's why they're not listening. You're actually wrong about the situation. Now, they might also be wrong, but what are you going to do about that? Nothing. But you can stop being wrong. And so if you try a couple of times, Say you're telling some things to a family member for their own good. And maybe you actually are, and maybe it is for their own good, and maybe they should listen, and maybe you're right, all of those things. But they're not listening. And you've told them like six times and nothing's happened. Quit telling them. It isn't working. The problem isn't the problem you think it is. That's why your approach isn't working. And so one of the things you can do in a situation like that is quit, just quit doing it. And I would say pull back from the person. How you approach someone who's drowning in the water, who's panicking. You approach them with your foot out, swimming this way towards them. And you do that because, and you tell them, you have to stop panicking or I'm not going to rescue you. And the reason is because two drowning people is not better than one. Now you don't have to tell them that reason, but you could. <laughs> now, and so, if there's someone that you're dealing with who's intractable, sacrificing yourself and also being part of that intractable problem is not helpful. So you do what you can and you live by example. And maybe if the person has any chance, they watch you and maybe they have to watch you for 10 years and they learn or they fail to learn, in which case you've done what you can. And that's how it is. So it's responsive, it's, it's, it's example.
Hi, Dr. Peterson. Now, I'm a 17-year-old girl, and I'm told it's kind of rare for someone like me to listen to you. Well, maybe it is, but I don't think it is. So, you know, there's this idea that the only people who are listening to me are angry white men. <laughs> and I suspect there are probably some angry white men in this audience. <laughs> angry brown women in the audience too. And so, you know, all I can, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, this is just so absurd, is that, that I can't believe that this has even become controversial as I'm talking to people about, you know, taking responsibility for the state of the world onto themselves. And the radical leftist identity politics ideologues can only view this through the lens of their radical leftist identity politics. And instead of noticing that this isn't a political issue, except that I don't like the radical left to send the restrictions on free speech. for me. It's that the politics jumped its, its boundaries. The politicians started to do things that they don't get to do. They stepped into the philosophical realm or they stepped into the theological realm, and they should stay the hell out of both. Yeah. So, you don't get to mess with the privacy of free speech and the sovereignty of the individual. You're, you're no longer where you should be. You've transformed yourself into a tyrant, and not the good kind. Not that there is a good kind. So, now, the consequence of that in part has been that, because I've been objecting to that, vociferously and with a fair degree of success, the only response that can be mounted is the response that exists within that domain of conceptualization, that, that of identity politics. And so, since I'm objecting to that, then I must be the reprehensible enemy. It's like, well, good luck with that story. It's not going to work out, because that isn't what's going on. So, and so the, to this 17-year-old girl, it's like, who knows how many 17-year-old girls are paying attention to what I'm saying on YouTube? I would say it's in the tens of thousands, and perhaps it's in the hundreds of thousands. And so the mere fact that that isn't the story that a small subsection of the ideologically committed popular media is telling, because it's by no means all of them, by any stretch of the imagination, doesn't mean it's canonically true. So now it might be rare statistically speaking, for 17-year-olds to be listening to me, but there are plenty of them that are. I get letters from them all the time, and more power to them as far as I'm concerned. It's a complicated message that lectures are very sophisticated and difficult, and it's great that if, you're, if you happen to find that your interest is captured by them, then there's something to that. What advice would I have for teens like you? Do what you think's right, kiddo. <laughs> In 12 rules, you mentioned if people really noticed what you were teaching, there would be hell to pay. <clears throat> I think I noticed why, but would you please say why? Well, it's, it's, you know, I read a lot of critiques of Carl Jung, uh, and he's often accused of doing all a variety of malicious things, like starting a cult, for example. Every time I read one of those critiques, I thought, if you actually understood what he was up to, you, you, what you're doing is like accusing a mass murderer of jaywalking. So, what he was doing was so radical that, like, starting a cult, that's, that's not even in the same conceptual universe. Part of what Jung was trying to do was to put the metaphysical substructure back on the Western civilization. And to the degree that I, I understood what he was up to and can develop it to some degree and can communicate it effectively, then that's also what I've been trying to do for 30 years. And I've been trying to do it because I studied what I told you I was studying at the beginning of this talk. I looked at the worst things that I could see that people were capable of doing, and I looked at them for a very long time, and I tried to understand why they were doing it. And then, I, and they being me, and then I tried to figure out what the alternative was. And so I've been laying out the alternative, because that's what we need to learn from what happened in the 20th century. We need to learn the alternative to what happened in the Soviet Union, and we need to learn the alternative to what happened in Nazi Germany, unless we want what happened in Nazi Germany to happen again, or unless we want what happened in the Soviet Union to happen again. We need to learn our lesson. 
And so, and the lesson is an individual lesson, not a collective lesson. And I believe this to be empirically the case. The wisest commentators that I've read on Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union have all come to the same conclusion. The reason those tyrannies could exist and maintain themselves and then do the murderous things that they did was because the individuals that composed those societies rejected their moral, individual moral responsibility and allowed those catastrophes to take place. And I believe that to be the case. I think what we got west, what we got right in the west, is the idea that the political system, the economic system, the familial system, all of that rests on your shoulders. Your corruption corrupts everything. You're on the hook for it. And that's a terrible thing to know, but it also is something that gives you some dignity. It actually turns out that you are important. And you might think, well, that's all I ever wanted to know, that you know, I'm important, that I have a role to play. It's like, yeah, you better think that through. Because you know, there's, there's, there's two ways this works. Either you're a dust mode and everything you do is meaningless, and who the hell cares what difference is it going to make in a million years? Or everything you do matters. And when you make a mistake, everything shakes. And that's how it is. And you make a mistake, everything shakes. except by stopping to do, stopping doing those things. So it's built right into you. And so that's why I say well, there would be hell to pay if people noticed what I'm teaching, because like, that's a hell of a thing to teach people. It's a hell of a thing to realize yourself. It's partly why I try to be careful with what I say, because I've learned that you should be careful with what you say. So, is it hard for me to be away from my wife and family? Well, my wife comes along with me, so. She's here. 